The Curse of Canaan, A Demonology of History by Eustace Mullins. So I'm going to try to take a look at chapter number three. Secular Humanism, The Curse of Canaan, Demonology of History, used to Smallings. So I'll share with you my notes and my thoughts on the third chapter, which is Secular Humanism. Now, Secular Humanism basically has a lot of propaganda vehicles and it is propaganda that is the biggest enemy of your mind. The lies that come at you. And of course, those who are Canaanites are very good at lying. They have the spirit of lying. And they're empowered by the father of lies. And those were my comments. So the premise is that human interests take priority over all. And note, not God's interest. So, Mollins is trying to state that secular humanism is just about man or woman advancing his or her own agenda for his or her own purposes. And keep in mind, if you follow the Bible, that man, humankind, womankind, is fallen by the power of sin. So government exists for the good of all, supposedly. But statism and big government are promoted by the secular humanists. In other words, there's a f true form of government that exist or can exist, but then there's the empowerment of those who are in the cabal system to bring about humanist agenda. Now, government selects human interests and never spiritual interests. It's all about this life, okay, and nothing about the life to come. Okay, so government always selects human interests, nothing ever spiritual, and this life only, not eternal life. So there's basically two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world, which is run by the devil, and there's the kingdom of God, which is run by Jesus Christ. There's two aspects of life, so to speak. There's this life only, what you see, the temporal life, and there's the eternal life. Now, secular humanists are all about what? This life only. And all about which kingdom? The kingdom of the devil. So, there is confusion in the world, and that confusion comes because uh, there's no compassion in the world through the ones who run it, through the secular humanists. They are not really interested in helping people at all. Confusion in the world. Why? Because the humanists do not have it and they don't want to have it. Okay? They never want to alleviate suffering. Actually, they want to induce or inflict suffering on their enemies. And who are their enemies? All non Canaanites. Once again, according to Mullins, the curse of Canaan. 
The Canaanites were those who occupied the so-called promised land, and they were to be annihilated under Joshua. And Joshua did not do a thorough job. So a lot of Canaanites were left, and that's where all the trouble stems from, according to Mullins, and I think he's absolutely right. Now, the humanist government agencies, even the social agencies that supposedly are helping people, help them by degrading them, devaluing them, treating them as if they are items or commodities and not human beings, okay? So any semblance of help that seems to exist in government is really an illusion. It's just a way of degrading that person. Now what is the goal of the humanist? Okay, the humanist goal is the achievement of the welfare state, and we're seeing that big time, especially right now with the uh, bonuses that are giving to, given to people to stay home and not work. Okay, so the welfare state has just expanded tremendously. It was already bad, but when all this other stuff started, not using the word about the other stuff, but you know what I'm talking about. So this, the welfare state, has really intensified. Now, Mullins will say that they are centered in hatred meaning the controllers, the Kabbalists, the ones who run the system. And their source of hatred is what? Baal worship, Baal, Master, Lord, and that's the devil. And the devil is never about loving people. Jesus is about loving people. God the Father is about loving people. But never the devil. Okay? Now, the Canaanites offer human sacrifice, and they still do, and the biggest way they do it right now is called abortion, and abortion clinics are just places of human sacrifice. Sorry, I'm cutting it to you straight. There's life in the woman, life, sacred life. The Bible tells us God knit us together in our mother's womb. You realize when you were in your mother's womb, God was forming you, God was fashioning you. So child murder for Moloch. In fact, I just did a video on the movie Sabotage, 1936 by Alfred Hitchcock. And I used the scene there where Stevie is carrying the bomb to talk about sacrifice, human sacrifice, how they are telling the world they still sacrifice children and youth. And that was 1936. So on page 67, in case you're wondering where I'm at, I try to put the page numbers there. Um, there's a spiritual, spiritual signs of the Canaanites are one, denial of the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Kabbalistic claim. God did not make the world. The world just kind of came into being. <clears throat> now, Kabbal means tradition. So, once a Kabbalist, they're following the traditions, and the traditions are basically occult and devil worship, is what that means. So, Satan is in control of everything, and another name for Satan is Baal, or Baal. That's the Canaanite name for the false god who is in charge and spiritualism is practiced. By that is meant occult practices, trying to get in touch with the demons, and trying to get in touch with the devil's army, the demons, and then utilizing the power of those demons in this world. So basically they have a hatred of life and a hatred of others. Yes, they do have hatred, and yes, they're based on hatred. So here's a little idea of how uh, secular humanism developed. 
We have to start at the very bottom here. It was Baal worship in Canaan, the land of Canaan. Then it went to Pythagoras, Pythagoreans, then to Plato, into the Hermetics, and then into Gnosticism. And that was what was popular in the days of the New Testament. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek, and Gnosticism means that you, you're in on the knowledge, you know things. And then that led to the, what are called the mystery cults, and that mystery cults led to what's called Kabbalah, or traditions. So basically traditions are just taking all this stuff, all this stuff from on in the past, and just sort of telling people, here's how it works. And this is what you can do if you want to be part of it. And that's where your secret organizations come in, your secret societies. So the next level up is Neoplatonism, which then led to the Enlightenment, which the Enlightenment was really just disenlightenment. Oh, excuse me, wait a minute. I have to go backwards here. Uh, Sorry, I jumped ahead on you there. The Kabbalah went to the Renaissance, which means rebirth. And then Utopianism, which out of that came Communism. He has that in there. But the next step would be Neoplatonism, then Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is really disenlightenment. It's really taking uh, the things that were true and telling you they're not true and then replacing them with falsehoods. So in case you're wondering about the period called Enlightenment, then Marxism comes, Socialism, Freudianism, and so forth. So on page 68, we would pick it up. It begins at Crotona. It was a mystery school, and the mysteries revealed to the initiates and it's the first school of dialectics. So what's going to happen now is eventually the occult is going to look intellectual. It's going to be combined with things so that it becomes presentable in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of people. Now many precepts of the school of Pythagoras appear centuries later in the book called Zohar, and that's tied into what's called the Kabbalah, or the traditions. And the traditions are just basically occultism, uh, quantified or, or systematized. All right, and you're listening to the clock in my office. <laughs> um... And then there's numerology, and it's taught in that school. And then there's tetractus, which is the sacred number 10. And then showing you how you get the sacred number 10, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10. Plato was more than a philosopher. Plato worked with the secret elite. The secret elite. So in the Republic, Plato, it will be a guide for secular humanists so that the secular humanists can achieve total control. Now remember, that's always what it's been about, is the total control of the total world by just a select few. Now the transmigration of the souls or now we know as reincarnation, was accepted by Pythagoras and Plato. So a lot of these folks that deal in these, in these uh, hoaxes and things like that, they have very strange beliefs that are absolutely incorrect with the Bible and the New Testament. The soul does not transmigrate to another body or to an animal or anything. The soul goes immediately, immediately, to the presence of God, 
for judgment. All must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> now they are involved in demon worship, and that's tied into the worship of the devil. And that then uh, was made respectable by schools of philosophy. And those schools of philosophy will emerge out of Plato. So now it looks acceptable. You're intellectual because you quote Plato and Neoplatonism, New Platonism, which then means that, that you can participate in the occult system but look presentable, intellectual, but it's really just part of the Canaanites and their cabal system. So humanism is a creed devoted to the conspiratorial enslavement of humankind by a secret el elite. Page 69. Humanism is a mixture. What's it a mixture of? Pantheism. It is God is sort of everywhere and in everything. Nature worship. You worship the sun, you worship the moon. You don't worship the creator of the sun or the creator of the moon, the one true God. You worship the sun or the moon. Gnosticism, that is knowledge, secret knowledge that you know, and hermeticism. <clears throat> now, he cites Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, 16. Beware of the false prophets. So the Kabbalah, meaning traditions, and you can spell it with a C, in the book of Zohar, came about near, supposedly around 1,280. Now I did some videos too, questioning the whole Middle Ages, that they didn't exist. Basically, there's a thousand years that never happened. You know, everything about castles and knights and all that is nonsense. But uh, Mullins doesn't get into that. That's my little extra comment there. Okay, now, the law from Moses is just sort of plain meaning. But what they'll do, they'll take the Bible and they'll assign a secret meaning to things. And they'll actually take the Bible, the Word of God, and turn it into something occult by their misinterpretation and their assigning secret meanings. Now remember the devil did this sort of thing on Jesus in the temptations in the wilderness, how he was actually quoting scripture, but the manner and the way in which the devil quoted it was evil. So he said he would give his angels charge over you. So throw yourself off that cliff and show everybody, the angels will catch you. So you see, uh, the devil will utilize the Bible and many of these occults and cults do utilize the Bible. Now, here's something very interesting that I came across that I really want to talk about is Walter Martin who is looked up to as just absolutely outstanding because of his book, The Kingdom of the Cults. And Mullins was on to him. And Mullins says he never mentioned the Kabbalah. Do you know why? Because Walter Martin was in the Kabbalah system. And did you ever notice all those shows that were done about spiritist or strange cults or whatever, they always had the guest as Dr. Walter Martin versus the Satanist versus the Jehovah Witness versus the, um, the Zoroastrian religion or something. It was always Dr. Walter Martin, Dr. Walter, what's what you call controlled opposition. 
So Dr. Walter Martin was right in there with them. And I also remember seeing very, very, very early video of Dr. Walter Martin actually appearing on a game show before he got popular with his refute, refutation of false religions, indicating to me that he had connections before he ever even got real famous. So don't trust this man. Now his labors and his books are what you might say absolutely outstanding. However, they have their plants throughout all systems. And a lot of times when you think that individual's on my side, you're incorrect. <laughs> because they control both sides of everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything, all right? So, anyhow, I put my little comment here about Dr. Walter Martin. Uh, Walter Martin was one of the elite. Martin played the good guy in the use of Hegelian dialectics to advance the hidden agenda of the elites. Martin was on a TV show as representing classical Christianity, as an expert to fool the masses. Now keep in mind, they always present people as experts, and basically, the truth of the matter is, there are no experts in anything. <laughs> and that's my expert opinion, all right? Because the entire system is in the hands of the controllers, there are no good guys or good gals. Remember, it's Hegelian dialectics. They control A and they control B. So that A and B will dialogue, clash, fight, whatever, and then the result is C. But then when C occurs, they'll record, they'll control C and D. So C will fight with D, and then that will create E. Thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and synthesis. That's what Hegelian dialectics is all about. So you can see it right here, thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and then synthesis. So Walter Martin, a cult member, or an occult member, and then the synthesis, which is usually to get you to doubt or question or begin to get rid of your traditional belief, even if Dr. Walter Martin wins the debate, even if you feel like Oh, that was close, but Dr. Walter Martin won. So it gets you to doubt God's Word, gets you to consider these cults or occults, gets you to consider the false religion, gets you to consider the occult. And you might want to praise Dr. Martin, that Dr. Walter Martin played a significant role in getting Americans to be exposed to the doctrine of demons. And that's the truth. He exposed him to them. Even though you think he was the champion, even though you think he was the victor, what he did was allow you to be exposed to the lies of that cult or occult. So the Kabbalah spreads in Europe through Neoplatonism. This is page 71. And during the Renaissance or rebirth of the classics. Renaissance means rebirth. And they were bringing out the classics of ancient Greece and ancient Rome and saying, oh, weren't those great? When in reality, all the classics of ancient Rome and Greece were just basically the occult and demonic. They were not the Bible and the truth. So the book of Zohar, there are demons on earth due to sexual congress or the sexual union of these demons with women. And that goes back to Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God, meaning the devils or the demons, saw that the daughters of men were fair. And they had relations with them and produced these hybrids. 
Now the Neoplatonists uh, are involved in homosexuality and that's why it's so prevalent promoted in every television program imaginable right now because that is their preference. They want to go against God's sacred order. So in the Hermetic writings and in Gnosticism and Kabbalah, it's all combined and was called Neoplatonism. Once again, this looks intellectual. This looks sophisticated. But it's basically just utilizing the teachings of the devil and the doctrines of the demons. So the emphasis of Neoplatonism is internal illumination, which means now you've got knowledge, you've got light, but the light is the false light of Lucifer. There's some form of ecstasy in terms of of you get some kind of a euphoria. Some, there's a feeling that goes with the knowledge. And then there's mysticism. Mysticism. And rationalism. And you bring these two together, and it all spells, with the other two, it all spells Neoplatonism. So the offer is of the self to be liberated. Now, my note on this is Christianity is crucifixion of the self, the sinful self. Now, I'm only talking about what's called the flesh or the sinful self in Christianity, especially the book of Galatians. Paul writes about the crucifixion of the self. In other words, you don't want that old man to be living so he needs to be stay, staying on the cross. He's there on the cross, and he always wants to come off the cross and jump back into your life, that old man or that old woman, that sinful self. But you are responsible to keep him on the cross, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you, and you have the Word of God. But he or she the sinful self, the sinful man, the sinful woman is always wanting to come back into your life and take control of everything. So back to the Renaissance, which means rebirth. It dominates Europe, okay? And it has uh, a element of of uh, of the of uh, the earth and the, and the st and the stars and the waters and everything. Okay, on page seventy one in the book, you can look that up. I'm a little unclear what my notes are. It's been a while since I've looked at my notes and gone over this. So I'll leave that one alone for right now. Sorry about that. Uh, he talks about the black nobility, the Medici in Italy, and they will acquire a lot of money and they will create schools, academic schools in Florence, Italy, and the schools will basically be, the academies will be nothing more than Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism is just simply the intellectual intellectualization of your Kabbalah system. So you have a Christian Kabbalism, so to speak, which is an oxymoron. And you cannot combine these two, because this is forbidden by Holy Scripture. So there is no such thing, but it's presented in that way to the world and it makes it attractive. So Neoplatonism, along with this Christian Kabbalism, then equals the Renaissance humanists, according to Mullins. And then humanism is being taught in the universities. 
And that's on page 72. Now, there's nothing Christian in it. Okay, the names sound good, and their presentations sound good, but in essence, humanism is in opposition to the Holy Bible. Now, God is excluded. Remember, that's the purpose of humanism. It's all about man or woman, humankind, and it's all about this life. And this life is imperfect, and therefore there is disorder. Now, they know that, and they take advantage of it, and they use that disorder that already exists to create more disorder so that they get their order. And remember, the big motto of Masons is order out of chaos. So in the, in the Republic, Plato will try to set up a perfect world. Now remember, there's never going to be a perfect world until Jesus returns to this earth and his kingdom is made visible. Right now, the kingdom of God is invisible. So, for example, you could look at me and say, I don't see anything in him that, that I know of would make him part of God's kingdom. Well, you can't see it with your human eye. But inside of me is the kingdom of God because Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is my King. I bow to him and not to Baal. Oh. So the dictators then set up and try to control. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to achieve something like Plato's Republic. And there's all kinds of variations on it. But that's where you have what he calls the utopia schemes. And the best known utopia scheme is communism, which is really basically <laughs> Not much of a utopia, saying everybody's equal. But, of course, the great line, and this is my note, not Mullins, the great line in the book The Animal Farm is some animals are more equal than others. And incidentally, based on this right here, I feel certain that's what's going on right now that the economy is being collapsed so that after it is collapsed then people will beg for it to be controlled and then the government will control it completely and then that is moved then in towards a communistic economy okay where the law of supply and demand, free market, and all that stuff will no longer exist because everybody will be begging for the government to do something because we're going to have shortages. They're already creating them, the shortages. Okay, Neoplatonism, page 72, is a perfect hiding place for the heirs of the rights of Baal. In other words, uh, it's just Canaanite religion with chocolate coating. So it might be like a chocolate-covered cherry. The cherry inside is Baal worship. But the outside, the chocolate, is sort of an intellectualism that looks good in the eyes of those that love education. So Neo meaning new, Platonism meaning Plato. And of course, Plato was about um, the occult. Now the Renaissance garments and then the Enlightenment is like a garment too. Okay, So these two are garments. And again, my view is the Enlightenment should be called the Disenlightenment. That's when they started substituting lies for truth. And people started to believe the lies, thinking they were true. 
because they promoted it as science. Now my note on all of this, not <clears throat> Mullen's note, again I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, is when the Augustinian monk Martin Luther makes his remarkable Bible discovery of justification by faith alone and not by a Kabbalist system that was employed by the Roman Catholic Church helped to prevent the complete takeover of the world at that time or the new world order from being achieved because it threw the whole thing back tremendously. So his Bible discoveries helped to prevent world dominance of Baal worship and even to this day true Bible believing people st stop the Baal worshippers from 100% control of this world. And if you really want to know what will stop the New World Order, it's by faith in God. A faith like Martin Luther, the Augustinian monk, promoted. A faith that overcomes the world, as it says in the epistle of John. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will help prevent the entire takeover of the world. <clears throat> you and you alone are the biggest threat because your faith exposes all of this. If people will only believe the true faith as is given in the Holy Bible. Now, uh, the, dollar, the dollar bills or the money that came in in Italy, which during the Renaissance period, that was where your money was centered. And in particular, the family called the Medici. And they used the Neoplatonism and they began to get control everywhere. Okay? Now the Canaanites versus the people of Shem. In other words, if you want to look at it this way, the ungodly versus the godly. Okay? The chosen of God versus the chosen of the devil. If you want to look at it that way. Now back to the book on page 73 whereby Mullins will take on feminism and he's seeing it come out of Freudianism bisexuality and the drug culture and all this kind of emerges out of Freudianism now I don't have the connection there for you but if you have the book uh, you can do some studies and by the way, those of you that have the book and are reading it or have read it, please make some comments. Please have some add additions to this. Now, humanism is basically socialism, or we can say it another way. Socialism is basically humanism. And that's Fabianism. Okay? And Fabian uh, is the slow movement of society towards socialism, a slow movement. Now humanism is atheism, amorality, meaning no morality, throwing out morality, throwing out right and wrong, and then a socialist world governed by the state. So if you put A in front of something, it negates. So in the Greek language, so if you have morality, amorality means morality negated. Theism or belief in God negated by the A. Atheism, no belief in God.
So atheism, you do not believe in God. A morality, no belief in morals and morality. <clears throat> okay, he mentions uh, Mr. Lamont, who's a son of the partner J.P. Morgan Law Firm. He's a spokesman for humanism. And he wanted to, there's, there was a movement to replace the Christian wedding ceremony with a, wed a ceremony of humanism. By the way, I've noticed that a lot too, that things that are once always in the domain of Christianity, now they move it out and they try to get someone else to do it, but it has no meaning whatsoever to the Christian faith. So in 1953, the Humanist Manifesto will come out and it will be out in the open and they will state their beliefs. Now, um, God is the true giver of rights to people, okay? So if anybody wants to talk about my right, it's only because you were made in the image and likeness of Almighty God. So all rights stem from God who created you, created me, and we are the people of Shem. And hence, that's where we derive our rights. Now, what the humanist did was to say, all rights come from the government. And we can even change that word instead of saying rights, privileges. So you only have privileges because the government gives them to you. Government gives and the government takes away. Government gives, the government takes away. So we've been seeing a lot of this. I remember growing up in school, in grade school, mostly in grade school, and to go out and use the water fountain to get a drink of water you had to ask for the privilege. You had to raise your hand. May I go get a drink of water? I don't remember doing that in junior high or high school because I think by that time you're supposed to have done that in your exchanges in the hallway. But anyhow, it's the government that bestows and the government takes away. So the government gives and the government takes away. Incidentally, that's been my phrase, taking it out of the book of Job, because Job says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So the government gives, the government takes away. And that's what's going to be true here with all this generosity, with these bonus checks for staying home, and then getting everybody dependent upon these free checks. Well, the government gives and the government takes away. So when the government takes away, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when the government takes away the bonus checks? What's going to happen when the government takes away the entire welfare state system? Well, you can imagine that would be your Hunger Games and stuff coming into play. All right, so uh, no government can give to people of Shem rights and privileges, nor can a government take them away, okay? because they're inherent by God. But this is the system that you and I are put under. We're under this. But ultimately, this is what the truth is. Now, the principal agencies of humanism or the billion dollar foundations, okay? And they were created to subvert the American Republic. And one of the ones that he talks a little bit about is called the Peabody Fund. Um, and I'm gonna have some fun with this at some point. 
because you remember that cartoon, Sherman and Peabody, and their journeys in history. I don't know if you remember that at all, but I would imagine that was to be a pawn on this whole idea of the Peabody Fund, or Peabody Fund. Now the Peabody Fund uh, was carpetbagger power because they conquered the southern states after 1865. Basically, when the Libra Code came out and put the southern states in enslavement, it basically sort of bankrupt everyone down there because uh, the money was in the South prior to what we call in hoax history American Revolution or uh, American Civil War. Uh, the money was in the South. Now the industrial base was starting to develop in the North. And the South was just primarily agriculture and money. But it had the money and it had the political power. So therefore it was taken out by the North. And after 1865, with the carpet bagging process in the South, the South got depleted of its resources. So uh, Mullins will make note of that. And here's my notation about the cartoon Peabody and Sherman and the Peabody Fun and Sherman the General of the Civil War. It might be a, um, a pun on that whole idea, the Peabody Sherman cartoon. Is this cartoon series filled with truth? Uh, by the way, Mullins didn't say that. That's me. <laughs> Why Kabbalah's system states the victims must be told the truth if the spells are to be successful. And that's why there's truth in fiction, truth in the movies, truth in cartoons. Because they're telling you the truth, but they're using a form and a format that your mind won't accept as being the truth. So I might have some future videos on the Peabody and Sherman cartoons. Now, secretaries of state and later become presidents come out of and they're part of the Rockefeller Foundation. I mean, the secretaries of states or presidents later go into these foundations. So that should tell you a lot, like John Foster Dulles, Dean Rusk, Cyrus Vance, and Henry Kissinger. So what's the mission? To infiltrate and control what? The institutions, education, government, religion, medical even. Now where do they get their training? Well, they get their training at Tavistock. <clears throat> and Tavistock is basically uh, England or the British PSYOP Center. Now the foundation arose by the efforts of Daniel Coit Gilman and the Rockefeller Foundation comes out of the Southern Education Board, the Peabody Slater Fund, Peabody and Slater Fund, and the General Education Board later is tied in with the Rockefeller Foundation. So you can see these institutions then get bombarded by these foundations and the foundations provide uh, finances to them and hence they bow to them and then they begin to change things the way they want to change them. So the Russell Trust at Yale University with Andrew White and Timothy Dwight then comes out of that skull and bones and the Brotherhood of Death. Avril Harriman uh, and the Brown Brothers and Prescott Bush and William Buckley. So the Skull and Bones is not a chapter of Freemasons, not direct connection to the Masons according to Mullins. Mullins puts Skull and Bones in the Illuminati, so he believes in a select group higher than just the, the lower level stuff called the Illuminati. 
one of the secret and highest degrees. So this concludes, I believe, chapter number three on secular humanism. And again, it came out of the book, The Curse of Canaan, A Demonology of History by Eustace Mullins. And I hope it was helpful to you. And I hope to someday do a little more work on this book. I'm sorry I'm so slow at getting around to it, but I get a lot of other interest as well. And I hope that you stuck with this to the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching. End of video.